So let's start off with tension pneumothorax, which is probably the most common um, and the most serious of the pulmonary life threats. How does the tension pneumothorax work? Well, very simply, a pneumothorax occurs when air enters the pleural cavity. In trauma, this is typically happening because of a direct injury to the lung. So if you have a stab wound to the chest, you penetrate the lung, air leaks out of the lung parenchyma into the pleural space. In blunt trauma, it's often rib fractures that will penetrate the lung, causing development of a pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is a special subtype of pneumothorax, which occurs when you have a one-way valve effect in the pleural space. So basically what happens in a tension pneumo is during inspiration, the patient is able to suck air through the trachea, through the lung, and out into the pleural space. But then during expiration, that one-way valve slams shut and the air that entered the pleural space is unable to get back out. So what happens is with each and every breath, the patient pulls more and more and more and more air into the pleural space, which causes a large high pressure air collection. So what are the complications of this? Well, one, your patient will almost invariably be hypoxic because the tension pneumothorax will start off compressing the lung on the affected side, but as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's gonna shift the mediastinum over to the contralateral side and cause compression on that side as well. So you get significant hypoxia because the lungs are mechanically squished and unable to work properly. You also get impaired cardiac filling. So direct compression of the mediastinum from the large air collection is gonna compress the heart and prevent the heart from filling normally. And lastly, you get impaired venous return. So in normal physiology, blood comes back from the periphery into the central circulation because of negative interthoracic pressure. You can imagine if you have a large high pressure air collection in the chest that your interthoracic pressure is gonna be positive. So now you don't have a pressure gradient that propels blood from the periphery back to the heart, and this is gonna further impair your cardiac filling and your cardiac output. So when we're trying to diagnose a tension pneumothorax, we wanna listen for unilaterally absent breath sounds. This is why the first step of our primary survey uh, for breathing is bilateral auscultation of the lungs. If breath sounds are absent on one side, you should strongly suspect a tension pneumothorax. We also wanna look for evidence of respiratory distress. Our patients with pneumothoraces um, are often working very, very hard to breathe because their chest is already hyperexpanded with this big air collection. So they have to work hard to pull air into that overinflated chest and they'll have clinical distress on exam. They're almost invariably gonna be tachypnic for the same reason. We already talked about why they would become hypoxic. And then as you can imagine, the trachea is gonna be deviated away from the lesion because this big expanding air collection is gonna push everything off to the other side. So an important thing to remember about tension pneumothorax is it doesn't, doesn't just affect the lung. In addition to respiratory impairment, our patients are gonna have shock. So I already mentioned that you have impaired venous return. You have mechanical compression of the heart. This is gonna prevent normal cardiac output from taking place. So these patients are gonna be tachycardic, they may be hypotensive, and tension pneumothorax represents a form of obstructive shock. So we wanna look not only for evidence of pulmonary compromise, but also for evidence of circulatory compromise in our patients with tension pneumo. Now, tension pneumothorax is not usually a radiologic diagnosis. Usually this is something we diagnose clinically. Um, but if you do happen to get an x-ray, there are some characteristic findings that you're gonna expect to see. On this image, we have lines outlining the separation of the lung from the pleural space. Now this patient must have some underlying lung pathology because you can actually see that the lung tissue is tethered to the pleura in one location. Maybe he has some old scarring in that region from a prior injury, hard to know. But he's got two regions of, um, of air where you don't see any lung markings and those are denoted here and here. So you can see the line demarcating the lung tissue from empty air space and you can actually see inside of the air collections that there aren't any lung markings. 
you also see inferior displacement of the diaphragm. So on the patient's right-hand side, I've outlined the normal contour of the diaphragm. And on the left-hand side, you can see it's pushed down much lower. And that's because this high-pressure air collection is taking up a lot of room in the chest and actually displacing it inferiorly. And for the same reason, it's displacing the mediastinum, which is normally a left-sided structure, into the middle or right-hand side of the chest. Now, you don't want to get this x-ray. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. Getting an x-ray of a patient with a suspected tension pneumo is only going to delay your treatment for the patient, and it's not necessary. So if you have a clear-cut tension pneumo on clinical grounds, go ahead and treat it. Don't wait around for radiographic confirmation. So what are we going to do to treat a tension pneumothorax? Very simply, the first-line treatment is needle decompression. And what we're doing when we decompress the lung is allowing air to get out of the pleural space. So if I've got a big high-pressure air collection here in my chest, the goal of decompressing is to make a conduit between the inside of my chest and the outside world that'll let that air escape. And what's going to happen is that's going to equilibrate the pressure inside of my pleural space with the atmospheric pressure. However, it's not going to make my pneumothorax go away. It's not going to actually restore negative pleural pressure. I'm still going to need a chest tube, but it's going to decompress the large air collection that is mechanically interfering with my cardiac function and my pulmonary function, and it's going to improve the clinical status of the patient very rapidly. So I do want to emphasize it's a temporizing measure. It's not definitive treatment. What you're really doing when you decompress is you're taking a tension pneumothorax and you're converting it into a simple pneumothorax. Needle decompression is also not indicated for simple pneumothoraces because it doesn't do anything for those patients. We only use it for unstable patients with tension pneumothorax, and the goal is to restore their normal perfusion and normal oxygenation while we go about providing them with definitive treatment. So how do you do the procedure? It's actually a very simple and straightforward procedure, and it's incredibly rewarding to perform because patients go from being an extremist to being stable and comfortable and happy very, very quickly. So if you get a chance to do this, um, I think you'll find it to be um, very satisfying. The way it works is you take a 14 or 16 gauge angiocath or basically any large bore angiocath or needle, and you're going to insert it at the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line. So you're gonna palpate both sides of the clavicle, you're gonna identify the midclavicular line, and then the second inner space is typically about one centimeter below that. So that's what you're gonna aim for. You also can use the fourth or fifth inner space in the anterior axillary line um, if that anatomy is more favorable for your patient. Either one is acceptable. So once you've inserted the needle, this is the really important part. You need to make sure that the needle is open to room air. So you want to insert the, the needle or angiocath in as far as it goes, and then you want to take off your syringe, take off your needle lock, anything that might be obstructing the end of your, um, of your catheter, and you want to let the pleural space communicate with the air in the room. The goal, again, is to let air go from the pleura out into the atmosphere. In addition to needle decompression, there are other elements of treatment that you want to perform. Of course, you want to give these patients supplemental oxygen um, to help decrease their respiratory distress and ensure that they're not hypoxic. You want to avoid positive pressure ventilation until such time as you've addressed the tension pneumothorax. Because as you can imagine, when we put a patient on positive pressure ventilation, we are actually pushing air down into their lungs. And if they have an injury that's led to a tension pneumothorax, we're going to be pushing air out through that injury into the pleural space and expanding the pneumothorax, which is going to make them worse. So if your patient needs to be intubated, if they need to be mechanically ventilated, you should do that after you've already addressed your uh, pneumothorax. You also want to place a chest tube once your patient is stabilized. So you're going to insert um, a large caliber chest tube onto the affected side, and that's what's going to restore your negative pleural pressure and allow the lung to heal. This is necessary in order to allow the lung to fully re-expand and eventually allow it to seal off the defect that caused the tension pneumothorax in the first place.
So just a quick compare and contrast between tension and simple pneumothorax, because it's really important to be able to differentiate between them since the treatment is so different. First and foremost, hypoxia. Patients with tension pneumo often have severe hypoxia, whereas patients with simple pneumothorax might be slightly hypoxic, but typically um, it's not extreme. Tension pneumothorax causes shock because of the physiology we've already described, whereas simple pneumothorax should never cause shock. Simple pneumothorax does not impair cardiac function, it does not impair venous return, and it should have no hemodynamic consequences. Breath sounds in tension pneumothorax are almost always going to be completely absent on the affected side, whereas in simple pneumothorax, you might have uh, normal breath sounds, you might have reduced breath sounds. If the pneumo is large, you may even have absent breath sounds, but it's much more typical to be able to hear something, whereas in a tension pneumo, you can often hear nothing. For tension pneumothorax, we temporize the patient with needle decompression. So we're going to go and stick a needle in the affected side to allow air to escape from the pleural space. Whereas in simple pneumothorax, that procedure is not indicated and really only carries risk with no benefit. So we would never do it. Patients with tension pneumo always need definitive treatment with a chest tube, and patients with simple pneumothoraces often do as well. It's quite common that we place chest tubes in those patients, but for small pneumothoraces, sometimes you can treat just with high flow oxygen, or in some cases you can uh, use pleural drains, pigtail catheters, et cetera, as opposed to a large caliber chest tube. So you've got a few more treatment options available to you for simple pneumothorax. With tension pneumo, you're always going to go for a chest tube. All right, so the bottom line on tension pneumothorax is you should always suspect it in patients with chest trauma who have unilaterally absent breath sounds, hypoxia or severe respiratory distress, or shock. Those are the things that should make you think about tension pneumo. And when you're concerned about a tension pneumo, you want to make the diagnosis clinically. Once you've made the diagnosis, you're going to perform a needle decompression in order to temporize the patient. And then once they're stabilized, you're going to place a chest tube, which will serve as their definitive management.